Have you ever wondered how a nuclear missile can find its way halfway across the world and be within less than 100 meters of its target and not use GPS? In fact, as the accuracy of the intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs increased, the size of the warheads decreased, which is why nuclear warheads of the late 1950s to early 60s were the largest ever created, because at the time, the accuracy of a ballistic missile was about one to three kilometers, or 0.6 to 1.9 miles. Even a megaton device might not destroy a hardened deep underground facility if it were detonated nearly two miles away. So the race was on to make missiles as accurate as possible, and the spin-off from this would enable both the moon landings and the exploration of the solar system. This need to deliver a warhead to a remote target can be traced back to the V1, and in particular the V2 weapons that Germany developed during the Second World War. There had been many attempts to create a way of delivering large explosives to a target with a remote controlled aircraft. These were in fact the ancestors of the drones we see today. But these were just remote controlled aircraft which used early television cameras which beamed back the signal to another aircraft which would be flying close by to guide it to its target with a full load of explosives. The V-1 flying bomb was different because unlike the remote controlled versions of aircraft, the V-1 was autonomous. Once they were launched, they would carry on until they either were shot down or they hit on or near the target. In fact, it didn't really matter if they didn't hit the target. They were terror weapons designed to instill fear into the population where they were targeted at. The fact that they could come down almost anywhere made it even more scary, and that's exactly what the Germans were trying to achieve. But the problem with these was they were still aircraft. They were still relatively slow moving and could be shot down by a fighter aircraft or anti-aircraft fire. And about 45% of them were brought down this way before they could reach their target. The next development, the V2 would bypass this completely. They would launch and fly high up almost to the edge of space before following a ballistic path down to a chosen target area. This meant that they were completely out of the range of conventional weapons and on their return journey, their terminal velocity, just before impact, could reach up approximately 1,790 miles an hour, 2,880 kilometers per hour, about 2.3 times the speed of sound. The only time you knew a V2 was approaching was when it hit the ground. The V2 was a liquid-fueled ballistic missile capable of carrying a ton of high explosive up to 320 kilometers or 200 miles, and was fully autonomous. Once it was launched, like the V1, it would carry on until it hit on or near the target without any external input. The guidance system of the V2 was a form of an early inertial navigational system, or INS. These had been used in aircraft autopilots to keep them in level flight without input from a pilot. But it was the first time they'd been used to guide a ballistic missile to its target. The inertial navigation system used gyroscopes which were connected to a variable resistor. This controlled a voltage which drove motors to eight movable fins. Four of these were air vanes, which would be for aerodynamic control, whilst the other four were graphite vanes which will be positioned within the rocket's exhaust stream, which will provide a powerful directional control, even at low speeds and high altitudes. One pair of these control surfaces were dedicated to pitch control. This would tilt the rocket up to 45 degrees from vertical, which was essential for the optimal angle to achieve the maximum range. The final part was the engine cutoff. This used an accelerometer to measure the acceleration and velocity. When the rocket had reached a predetermined velocity and distance depending upon the target, the engine was cut off, at which point the rocket would then fall back on a ballistic path as an unguided projectile onto the target. Although very advanced at the time, by today's standards, it's a very primitive system and didn't allow for course corrections or evasive maneuvers. This technology was still far more advanced than anything the Allies had. And after the war, the Americans, British and Soviets all made concerted efforts to get their hands not only on the rockets themselves, but the scientists that made them. 
many of the top German rocket scientists were brought to the US in Operation Paperclip, including the lead designer of the V2, Werner von Braun. Although von Braun had dreamed of going into space before World War II, space was the last thing that the US military was thinking about, just after the war ended. At the time, they wanted rockets, rockets that could possibly carry their newly developed atomic bomb. But placing a nuclear weapon on a rocket and firing into the sky was one thing, but getting it to guide itself thousands of miles to a target deep within the Soviet Union was another. The biggest problem that the engineers faced working on the early rockets based on the V2 platform was that any sensors that would be used as part of the inertial navigation system would have to put up with the rocket shaking, vibrating, pitching and yawing, and these could have a dramatic effect on the accuracy of the system. What was needed was a stabilised platform that would remain in the same position irrespective of what the rocket was doing. This is known as a gimbal stable platform and has three gyroscopic rings, each one rotating about a different axis. The outer gimbal rotates around yaw, the nose rotates left and right. The middle gimbal rotates around pitch, the nose rotates up and down. And the inner gimbal rotates around roll, the wings tilt left and right. Each ring has a gyroscope which maintains its orientation due to the conservation of angular momentum. If a missile rotates in one direction, the gyroscope detects this and sends a signal to motors on the rocket control systems, which then rotate it in the opposite direction just enough to cancel out the missile's movement. Inside the inner gimbal is the stable platform that is now isolated from the movement of what the missile itself is doing. Because the platform stays level, the accelerometers measure true acceleration, not confused by vehicle tilt. This data can be integrated to calculate velocity and then position. Without a stable platform, tilt would make accelerometers useless. Now, while the technology of missiles in the 60s and 70s increased in capability dramatically, technology today can also help you defend yourself from what sometimes seems like the wild west of the internet. Today's sponsor, CyberGhost VPN, can do a similar sort of thing for your browsing experience, encoding all your data and keeping your real IP address hidden from hackers and trackers. Their no logs policy means there are no digital footprints left behind when you use their VPN. And with over 11,000 servers in 100 countries, there's almost no place you can't be. But why is this important? Well, if you've ever been geo-blocked, that's locked out of a website or service because your country isn't supported, then by using CyberGhost VPN, you can appear to be in another country. This is something I use a lot because some US sites I use for research still think the UK is in the EU, even though it left over five years ago. By using CyberGhost, in just two clicks, you can unlock geo-restricted games and content from over 40 streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus. You can even score better deals online simply by changing your virtual location. It can be used on up to seven devices at once, which is great for the whole family, and it's supported by Windows, Apple iOS, Android, Linux, and many more platforms. With over 38 million users worldwide and over 20,000 excellent reviews on Trustpilot, it's one of the best VPNs out there. Click on the link in the description below to get their best ever deal at just over $2 a month plus four months extra for free, which is 84% off. And there's even a 45 day money back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. So how does this work in practice? Before launch, the platform is aimed at a reference direction. To do this, one access points north, one access points east, and one point straight up. This becomes the orientation reference for the whole flight. So now any movement can be compared to this initial setting. At launch and during the flight, the platform stays in the same orientation as it was before the launch. This allows the platform to measure true forward acceleration, true sideways drift, and true vertical changes. With these, it can now tell the missile how high it is, how far it's traveled, and whether it's drifting off course, and when to shut down the engine for the final descent and how to steer. 
This technology was developed in the early 1950s and would form the basis of all early ICBM guidance and later the Apollo Inertial Measurement Unit. However, the technology of the time still relied upon thermionic valves for the electronics and the gyroscopic elements were affected by the quality of the build that could be achieved at the time. The result was that the gyroscopes would drift over time and the longer they were running, the more the drift would become and the greater the inaccuracies would be. By the late 1950s, and with the introduction of the Atlas, Titan, Thor and Jupiter rockets, analog computers were being used to integrate accelerometer data, and gyroscopes were capable of generating between 1 and 2 kilometers of accuracy. Advantages continued to be made throughout the 1950s and into the 60s, as valves gave way to all transistor digital computers and fluid-supported rotors on gyros. These were used on the Minuteman missiles and became a direct ancestor to the Apollo guidance system. But there was still an element of drift, no matter how good the mechanics and electronics became. By the mid-1960s, star sighting was added and brought back a technique which the ancient sailors would have recognised, basically by using periscopes or small telescopes whilst the missile was in its space-based phase, it would compare the star patterns with an onboard catalogue and then update the inertial measurement system to remove any drift. Apollo did a similar thing with its optical sextant and IMU, although this was normally done by a human, but the technology was originally used on the Polaris A3 and Poseidon C3 ICBMs. Developments in technology during the 1970s and 80s enabled the accuracy to move from approximately one kilometer to about 100 meters and enabled the use of MIRVs, or multiple independent re-entry vehicles. In essence, one missile could carry multiple warheads, each capable of hitting a separate target. One of the big changes that came along was the move from physically rotating gimbals on a stable platform to strapping the gyros down and the accelerometers directly to the missile body, and then using digital computation to mathematically rotate the measurements into a virtual stable frame. This removed the issue of gimbal lock, which could occur if two of the three axes were aligned and then lock, removing the ability to measure one of the axes. It was also far lighter, cheaper and more reliable and had a faster response and was more tolerant to vibrations and became standard in the late 1970s. By the 1980s, spinning mechanical rotors were phased out and new gyros using light were introduced. These were known as ring laser gyros, or RLGs, or fiber optic gyros, FOGs. So how does a ring laser gyro work? Well, a laser beam is created and split into two beams, both following a path inside a laser medium in the form of a cube or a triangle, with the internal sides acting as mirrors. One beam goes in the clockwise direction while the other goes in the anti-clockwise direction. Depending upon the direction of rotation, the beam that goes in the direction of the rotation has a slightly longer path as the beam of light has to catch up with a rotating cube or triangle and the beam going in the opposite direction has a slightly shorter path. However, as they are both generated from the same laser beam, they have exactly the same frequency. And this slightly longer path shows itself as a slight decrease in frequency, and the shorter path a slight increase in frequency, similar to the Doppler effect. The faster the rotation, the greater the frequency difference, and by comparing which is higher or lower, you can determine the direction and rate of turn very accurately. In the fiber optic system, a long coil of fiber optic cable, often hundreds of meters long, is wrapped into a small coil and a similar process is done, sending two beams in opposite directions through the fiber optic coil. Here, the differences are in phase between the two signals. This is detected, and the direction of rate and turn can be computed. These light-based gyros had no moving parts and therefore no mechanical friction. They were extremely low drift, very reliable, and immune to vibration and temperature variations, ideal for the space-based part of the trajectory. At the same time, solid state accelerometers became available, which were far more accurate. And when partnered with ring laser gyros, 
the inertial error was dramatically cut compared to the older mechanical systems. By the 1980s, fully digital fault-tolerant computers and microprocessors, along with modern software for trajectory shaping, error modeling, and thrust control, enabled the real-time optimization of trajectories with much more complex mid-course maneuvers and allowed for rapid pre-launch targeting. Electronics were also radiation-hardened and made resistant to mechanical shock, as well as nuclear-generated electromagnetic pulses. This allowed longer storage lifetimes in silos to be achieved with reduced maintenance, although this contributed more to reliability than accuracy. By the mid-1990s, CCD star sensors and digital pattern recognition allowed missiles to do autonomous celestial navigation. But the biggest advance was GPS or Global Positioning System. Now, although this was a huge advance, it was not actually used during mid-flight because GPS signals can be jammed or even spoofed to make them appear to be somewhere where they're not. Instead, GPS is used before the launch to precisely align the missile's inertial platform. The more accurate the launch conditions, the better the target at the other end could become, and this could shave off sometimes hundreds of meters for silo-based or mobile-based launchers. MIRVs, the multiple independent re-entry vehicles, also gained their own inertial units, microthrusters with closed-loop control, as well as star sensors, making them as accurate as a single missile system, and allowed warheads to be placed within 50 to 100 meters of the target in high-end systems. From the 2010s onwards, AI and machine learning algorithms have been used to detect anomalies, predict drift, and optimize trajectories. What they don't do is autonomous targeting. The targets still have to be chosen by a human. It's just the maneuvering of a rocket which is smarter. And this brings us on to the current day and beyond, with experimental systems using quantum accelerators, atom interferometers, and quantum gyros for extremely low drift. When these come into service, they promise to have an accuracy equal to or greater than hypersonic glide vehicles. Because of the extremely low drift of the quantum devices, multi-hour drift times are orders of magnitude less, and there is no need for star fixes or GPS, making them jam-proof and ultra-high precision. Modern ICBMs are now so accurate that inertial navigation-only guidance can achieve target accuracy of well under 100 meters without any external signals. And this brings us back almost full circle to the V2, the first ballistic missile which relied upon inertial guidance only to find its target. Although with today's technology, it can be almost as accurate as if it were a guided missile. And even the hardest targets can be pinpointed from the other side of the world. And there is almost nothing that can stop a modern ICBM from finding its target. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, share and subscribe, and a big thank you goes to all of our patrons for their ongoing support. Don't forget to click on the link in the description below to grab the special CyberGhost VPN discount available for our viewers. It keeps your data safe while you browse online, and it unlocks all block content online for just $2.03 a month. It's completely risk-free, so why not check it out today?